What is God's nature? What is God all about? And, and who is God? If you were to just go out in the community or down the hill and talk to people, you'd get many different answers of, of who God is, what his nature is like. And of course, there's different religions, Buddhism, and many religions would say there are many gods. Mormonism would say you can be one of those gods. Or if you talk to an atheist, they would say there is no God. An agnostic would say we're not sure that there is or that we can know him if there is. For materialists, money is their God. For addicts, substance is their God. In pornography, sex is God. Satan says you can be your own God. And that can be power, it can be control, or that you can create your own destiny and identity. But what does God say? That's the question that the founding pastor of this church would often ask. What does God say? Let's look at what God's Word says, and that's what we're going to do today in Exodus chapter 34. Exodus is the second book of the Bible, Genesis, and then Exodus. And God is going to, in chapter 34, say the truth of who He is. This is one of the most compelling and concise and clear statements from God audibly about God. These are some of the most important, some of the most repeated descriptions of God in the entire Bible. God is defining himself, and this is the defining passage that other biblical writers would turn to again and again. In fact, the Old Testament itself quotes these words that we're going to read some 20 times in part or in whole. And just verse 6 of Exodus 34 is echoed many times by biblical writers, Numbers, Nehemiah, Chronicles, Psalms, and the Prophets. And the context of what we're going to read is Moses is in the cleft of a rock on Mount Sinai in Exodus 34, verse 6, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. This is what God says. This is who God is. And this is how we should respond. We should fall before him. We should worship him. We should see who he is, and that should change us. We're to be changed to, to be merciful and gracious like this God. We need to be more slow to anger. We need to be more loving, more faithful, and forgiving because of who God is and who he calls us to be. These are some of the highest words in all of Scripture about the Savior, and they come in the context on the heels of one of the lowest points of Israel's sin in chapter 32. That was the golden calf story, if you weren't here, where they rebelled. And Moses comes down from the mountain with the, the Ten Commandments, and he breaks the tablets before the people who had just broken the words, the covenant on the tablet. God threatens to wipe Israel out. But Moses intercedes for God's mercy, and he appeals to the very kind of God that is spoken of in this passage, this compassionate God who's gracious, who's forgiving, and who's giving steadfast love to countless thousands. In chapter 33, Israel repents. We saw this last time, and their merciful God relents, and he does not withdraw his presence, even though he could have and, and should have. We might have argued, but he's gracious and merciful. His covenant faithfulness restores the broken fellowship. And he's going to restore also the broken covenant and tablets. That's where chapter 34 starts. If you'll look with me at, in the context, chapter 34, verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. So God is going to rewrite and renew 
Verse 2, be ready by the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. This is because God is holy. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and the, he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and he took in his hand two tablets of stone. So Israel could not come up to hear this. But this text actually lets us come up. We get to hear this private conversation between God and Moses, which is for God's people to know about this God. There's no one else but Moses who was there, but this passage actually shows us God's glory like nowhere else. In fact, look at chapter 33, verse 18. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, God said in response, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for man cannot see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Now look at chapter 34, verse 5. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. This is Yahweh, as Pastor Corey mentioned earlier. Verse 6 in the Legacy Standard Bible says this, Yahweh passed by in front of him and called out, Yahweh, Yahweh, God, compassionate and gracious. We're going to see the revelation here of God's name and nature. We're going to walk through each of those descriptions here and we're going to see the revelation of God's name and nature is that he has compassionate grace will be the first one. He has patient, faithful love. He has forgiveness and justice. That's the revelation. And the response is that we need to bow and be changed. He calls out his name twice. He, Forty years earlier at a burning bush, there was a runaway murderer, fugitive, who had gone away from God's people, really didn't want to have anything to do with them, even when God called him. When God calls him at the burning bush, he calls him with his name two times, Moses, Moses. Another big moment on another mount in history, when Abraham was on Mount Moriah with his son there, another dramatic moment in redemptive history, his name is called out twice, Abraham, Abraham, the Lord calls out to him. Two times like that is emphatic to draw attention to a name, and God is now doing that with his own name. The Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh would be the Hebrew. Moses at that bush in chapter 3 had asked God, what, what if I go to tell them that God has sent me? And they ask, what is his name? What should I tell them? And here's what God replies, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me, Yahweh has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered in every generation. This is his eternal name and nature. He is the I am. He is the self-existent, self-sufficient, self-consistent God. He's the great I am that I am. And it could also be rendered, I will be what I will be. You can count on this God. And it's repeated for emphasis twice in chapter 34, verse 6. The Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh. It's not just a proper name. It's his personal character, his characteristics. Yahweh, Yahweh, the merciful is how it begins. As if mercy and grace is part of his very name, mercy and grace is the first phrase in verse 6. I'm calling it compassionate grace. These are commonly used words, mercy and grace, but they can sometimes lose their significance and depth. We can make them too common, like students maybe who 
didn't turn their paper in or, or even do it on time, and they, the time comes, they're before the teacher, and they say, can you give us grace? The teacher could say, getting more time isn't grace. Grace is, would actually be like me writing your paper for you and turning it in and giving you an A+. Plus. Because grace isn't like us doing our part and then we get a little bit of help, someone bails us out. We have a 0% and God does 100% of the work of salvation. That's grace. Or the stories told of a lady talking about uh, getting a picture taken. She's trying to make herself pretty and, and she tells to her friend holding the camera, make sure, you, make sure you do me justice with the picture. And her friend smilingly jokes with her. She says, you don't need justice. You need the camera to give you mercy, to, to make it even better than, than it really is. And that's maybe not very compassionate. But the Lord is, and he's truly gracious, and he gives us mercy better than how we are or what we deserve. But this is not the normal word for mercy in verse 6. This is a, a more unusual word that's used first here in the Scriptures. It's, it's really the idea of a mother's compassionate, tender mercies. You who are mothers in this room know about this. Here's how one Jewish writer describes it. He says, it comes from the Hebrew word for the womb. And this, this term suggests God's feelings towards humanity resemble those of a mother toward the children who come out of her womb. In fact, the prophet Isaiah picks up on this in Isaiah 49, 15, and 16. Let's read this out loud together. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. Even if that were, could happen on a human level, God says, I'm not going to forget you. I know you you are like on the palms of my hand. I will have compassion on you. This is Yahweh, Yahweh God. He has intimate, compassionate care, tender mercies, graciousness. John McKay says, Compassionate recalls a mother's love for her child with a deep understanding of its weakness and need, keeping look after it, whatever its behavior or thanklessness. And you also know this as, as parents. Sometimes their behavior and their, their thanklessness makes that a challenge, but you continue to show love to them. He says it's not a response to human merit. And it's actually when punishment might well have been expected. This word is often used in that way. And then the, word, the next word that God reveals, gracious, is this idea of, of giving favor that goes beyond any human calculation. It's undeserved. It is unearned. God is by nature a savior of compassionate grace. But I want you to see this a little bit later in Deuteronomy 4. So if you turn ahead, just Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The next time this word is used by the same writer to these same Israelites helps fill out how this term especially came to be used just a couple books later, there's this bad news for future Israel, but there's good news also for their future before the end of time. Deuteronomy 4, verse 26, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. This is the promised land of Canaan. You will not live long in it, but will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the people, so in other nations and lands. And you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. So this is what's going to happen in the future, but there's future grace. Verse 30, and he comes back to this phrase and word that he used in Exodus 34. Verse 30, when you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days... You will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. You're going to be scattered and all this, but in the latter days, there's going to be a day where you're going to return to the Lord and you're going to obey his voice. Why? Verse 31, for the Lord your God is a merciful God. That's the same phrase he used back in Exodus, but he hasn't used since. He's talking now, extending this to the future and to the end. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. That's God's covenant grace. 
for Israel, even to the latter days before the end of time and the tribulation that it speaks of there. It's the same word, merciful, compassionate. It has not been used since Exodus 34. It's a promise to the end. Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 6, repeats that prophecy that they will be restored to the land and they will be regenerated in their hearts. Israel is still unregenerate to this day. These are prophecies still to be fulfilled. But the prophets pick up on this. The major and minor prophets, Isaiah 54, verse 7, he says, With great compassion I will gather you. And with everlasting love I will have compassion on you. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love... It's also a phrase from Exodus 34, shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. It's an everlasting compassion. It's a steadfast love. This should give us great security. If, if you are, have been grafted in by faith into the, the Lord, that his love is steadfast. Other things may depart, but his love for his people will not and the same Hebrew word in Exodus 33, verse 19, used of will have compassion on you, is, is used pretty consistently for future grace to the Hebrew people, like Jeremiah 33, verse, let, let's read this out loud together. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, if I have not established my covenant with day and night and the fixed order of heaven and earth, then I will reject the offspring of Israel. I will have mercy on them. God says, no, I, I will have mercy on them. And even the evidence of the fact that there is still day and night shows that God's mercies have not come to an end. His compassionate grace is not through with the Jews or us. And, and as, we, as we see the increase of anti-Semitism and terrorism toward Israel, as we see wars and r rumors of wars all around the world, we need to pray for grace and peace to them through Jesus Christ. Not just for Israel, but for Iran as well. For many to come to Christ, and many are coming to Christ from that very land as well. But this is the hope for the future, hope for the world, and the hope that many peoples will come and turn to Christ, even the enemies of Israel who once cursed them. There can be grace for them. Ezekiel 39, 25, I will have mercy on the whole house of Israel. And he, t he goes on there to talk about pouring out his spirit upon the house of Israel. Zechariah 12, 10 says, I will pour out, that should say, on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. This is all language coming out of that Exodus passage. So that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn. Isn't that interesting? God speaking, they're going to look on me, they're going to look on him whom they have pierced that they'll see that they actually pierced God. They actually, they actually crucified their Lord and their Messiah. Zechariah 10, 7 says, I will save, I will bring them back because I have compassion on them. Israel will be saved. Others will be saved when they look to Jesus and they see that he is the one who has been pierced on a cross for their sin and will plead for mercy. There's grace for you if you confess, if you mourn your sin, if you repent, if you cry out to Christ, trust his compassionate grace. That's number one. And he has, number two, patient, faithful love. Patient, faithful love. Exodus 34, verse 6 says this, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger. God is a God of wrath and anger, but he is incredibly slow to anger. Don't, don't think God does not have anger or wrath, but he is he's incredibly, the, the idea of this is a, he has a long fuse. Yeah, he's long-suffering, some of the translations say. He's patient in his love. Isn't that how Paul describes the love of God? Love is patient and kind God is patient. God is kind. God is love 
in verse 6, and he's described as slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That Hebrew word hesed there is, can be translated love or kindness or loving kindness in some translations. Loyal love is another rendering. Faithful love. This is the same word in that familiar verse in Psalm 23, verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy. That's the word mercy shall follow me. Another translation has unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. That's, that's even a better translation. It's, it's not just tagging along behind. It's actually pursuing how his kindness yet pursues me. His, his faithfulness, his love is going after us. The kid's storybook Bible, Jesus' storybook Bible, defines this word this way, a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. You see, there's, there's not just any one word that can capture it, but that, that's written to help kids understand God's love is a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. Psalm 136 says at the end of every verse, His steadfast love endures forever. 36 times it repeats that. Every, all the phrases there, his steadfast love endures forever, or his loving kindness is everlasting. And Psalm 103, verse 7, is a quote, and it's really a commentary on our text, where it says, God made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel, and here's what it says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Word for word, right out of Exodus. And then it goes on to describe that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he has removed our transgressions from us. And it says, as a father shows compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And it's a compassion greater than you can even measure in the universe, the height and the breadth and the length and the depth of the love of God that we see in Christ the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting. Psalm 103 says that when David writes that psalm, bless the Lord, O my soul, forget none of his benefits, this is where he goes, Exodus 34. He goes back to that revelation of God and his benefits. Or Psalm 145.3, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall declare your works to another and, and commend your mighty acts. And here's where it goes then. Listen to that Psalm 145.8, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Word for word right out of Exodus. And then it goes on to apply that his mercy is over all. The Lord is faithful. There's that word also from Exodus, in all. This is when one generation would speak of God to another generation. They would go back to Exodus 34 and sometimes quote it word for word or paraphrase it. Like Lamentations 3.22, when they saw the disaster that had been prophesied on Jerusalem and the destruction there, here's what Jeremiah says in the heart of that book, the steadfast, this is Lamentations 3.22, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The King James Version says this, We are not consumed because his compassions, they fail not. Great is thy faithfulness. Amen. I mean, this is the hope for God's people, that he is faithful. That his love is not fickle like ours. His, his love for us is not dependent upon our love for him. That's why our salvation is secure. That's why our love relationship with him is secure, because it's based on him and not us. Those are the words... In that same word, steadfast love, two times there. And actually, it links faithfulness, Exodus 34, verse 6, when it goes on, steadfast love, abounding in steadfast love, and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands. Steadfast love, steadfast love, but right in the middle is faithfulness. It's like the meat of a sandwich, faithfulness or truth. This is a word for fidelity. And it's combined with that Hebrew word for loyal love or faithful love. 21 times those words are used together to emphasize that God's love is a faithful 
love. God is true in his commitment to love. He's abounding in covenant loyalty to thousands. And, and these two attributes bring together glory to the name of the Lord, and they should humble us. Psalm 115 verse 1 says, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Same phrase out of Exodus. He says it's not about us. It's not to us. It's to your name. And this is what brings glory to your name. It's, it's not for our sake. We don't deserve it. It's for his glory. His name deserves it. It's not to us or about us and our faithfulness. It's about his. And that is good news for us. That's good news for us. His name, his nature is patient, faithful, love. That's number two. And then the third pair of phrases there that come together. Thirdly and finally in this revelation part is forgiveness and justice. Exodus 34 verse 7 continues, he is also forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. God is not all love. God is not only love. He is also a judge. God is also just. God also must punish sin. He doesn't just pretend like it never happened. That would not be a, a, a good judge or even a good person. But there's, there's a tension here, isn't there? There's a question as to, to how God can be both forgiving and enacting justice. How he can have forgiveness along with being just. Guilt must be punished and paid for. And we'll need to look more at how that forgiveness works later on, but, but even just think about this on a, on a human level. Forgiveness doesn't necessarily erase all consequences of sin, individually or on a family. Even when relationships can be restored, there can still be consequences of sin and damage that is done, and sin can impact the third and the fourth generation. And Bear in mind that when he, he writes this, there were often three or four generations living in the same tent. That was kind of their family structure, parents, grandparents, all together. And this, the sin of one would affect the other. A 70-year-old sin can hurt grandkids and great-grandkids. And just to bring that home to us, your sin impacts those you live with. You need to recognize that and, and reconcile that when your sin affects others who, who witness it or those who are close to you. But also, kids are not, in Scripture, responsible or guilty, with that language, for the sins of their parents. Even though there might be things they need to recognize from their past, they need to be careful if their parents struggled with something that, that may be a struggle for them. But they're not responsible or guilty, and grace can break the cycle. So I want you to flip ahead to Numbers, just a couple books ahead, to see how this played out with Moses and this generation. Because what God said in Exodus 34 was seen as a promise and a powerful incentive to ask forgiveness. Numbers 14, 17. And now, Moses again is speaking, please, He's praying, please let the power of the Lord be great as you have promised, saying, and notice what he's going to quote now, you've promised this, saying, the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation. Moses is quoting Exodus 34. Please, he says, verse 19, pardon. In light of that, please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. And then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. But if you go on to read the passage, there would be consequences for the guilty still. Forgiveness did not erase their loss of land or even the loss of life that their sin brought about, the older generation would not enter the land, but the younger one could because they were not held responsible for the sins of their parents. 
Even Moses had that consequence of not entering the land, even though relationally and spiritually he was forgiven. He had no condemnation eternally, but there were consequences temporally. God can forgive and let us live, but let us not forget the principle of Scripture that sin reaps what it sows in your life and in others' lives. And there's a warning here that sin can forfeit earthly blessing. But sin, when it's forgiven, can never forfeit eternal blessings, which we can be thankful for. Here's, here's how Nehemiah put all this together. Nehemiah 9.17. You are a God ready to forgive. Now, notice, listen to what he says. You're ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He's quoting it again. And you did not forsake them, even when they made for themselves a golden calf and said, this is your God who brought you out of Egypt. They committed great blasphemies. You, in your great mercies, did not forsake them. The descendants went in and possessed the land. But after they had rest, they did evil again according to your mercies. And then he talks about how they would be taken out of the land and, and judged. Nevertheless, though, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. This is our God, beloved. Behold your God. I mean, see this truth throughout history of how he continually is gracious and faithful. Let this be like an, an ocean that you bask in and you just see more and more of, of, even though your sins are many, his mercy is more. Amen? His mercies are greater than your greatest sin. And so turn to him. Return to him if you are in sin. If you're living in sin, turn back to him. Come to the light. There's a, a scripture from 2 Chronicles 30, verse 9. It might be the next slide if you brothers can help me pull it up. Here it is. Let's read this out loud together. Your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him. And then Micah 7, 18. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives, delights to show mercy? You will again have compassion on us and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Didn't we sing that earlier? A sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. This is our God. Gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and forgiving, and all of that. That's his nature. So what's our response? Our response is we need to bow and be changed. Like Moses. In light of God's attributes, the right attitude is the Moses, uh, the, what we see from Moses. Look again at Exodus 34 and verse 8. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. Moses hoped to see the glory of God. Now he's humbled and he sees the ground as he bows. In verse 5, God came down to earth with words and the right response is Moses' head is down to the earth in worship. And I think also a bowed head is the opposite of a stiff neck. Remember, we've been talking about a stiff neck, the sin of Israel. A bowed head is the, is the opposite. Your head is bowed down, and, and Moses is in submission here as he brings this supplication. Verse 9, and he said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. Moses had been changed by grace, unmerited favor. And based on that favor, he's asking for forgiveness, not excusing it, not pretending it didn't happen or trying to sweep it under a rug, admitting the stubbornness, but asking for graciousness. He's been changed as he's come to know this God and this should change us too. We need to worship this God as we learn about this God. And when you think of worship, it's not about a music style that you want others to bow to. Worship isn't about you, it's about God and who he is. 
and it's bowing what you think to God. And specifically, this passage should change how we think about suffering. When difficult times come, pain is not the absence of grace. Pain is not the absence of grace. Listen to James 5.11. It says, you've heard of Job and the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. He's quoting that or paraphrasing that from Exodus, and he's applying it to the life of Job. If you know anything about the life of Job, you know he's not talking about being comfortable. Compassion and mercy are actually for when things are not comfortable, especially. That's not God's purpose for us to be comfortable, but he is compassionate. Psalm 86 is a prayer by someone poor and needy and suffering. There's threats on his life. He's in trouble. He's in danger. He's crying all day long. Those are all things he says in Psalm 86. But here's what Psalm 86, 15 says. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger. Sound familiar? When he's got nothing else to fall back on, he falls back on you're merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. If you haven't memorized that yet, you need to memorize that because that was the bedrock, the, the truth, Exodus 34, 6, and 7, that, that withheld God's people throughout history. We need to get back to that. We need to get it inside of us. You, O oh God, are merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So then he prays, turn to me and be gracious to me. Give strength to your servant. Do you ever need strength? Do you ever feel like what you're going through, you don't have the strength and the ability? Here's a great prayer to pray. Fall back upon this God and say, God, be gracious to me. Give strength to your servant. God answers that. That's an application of Exodus 34. This should change how we pray. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, to your name be the glory because of your steadfast love, because of your faithfulness. For your sake, would you give grace in this situation? Would you give strength? This is the God who says, I will be gracious. I will show mercy. And he will do it as he wills, but he does it in response to those who ask. And he tells his people to be gracious. He tells his people to be merciful. He, he gives those to us so that he can also give those through us to others. In fact, that same Hebrew word in Proverbs for being gracious calls for us to have gracious words. For us to be gracious in our help of the needy. The Bible calls us to do justly and to love mercy. Same word, like God, to be humble, to put on a heart of compassion, we're called to in the Old and New Testament. See, we need to be changed by these attributes to these attributes. Be merciful, Jesus says, as your Father is merciful. Let's read Proverbs 3, 3 together. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and then he will, what? He'll direct your paths or make your paths straight. But you see this, he's talking about these things that were written on tablets of stone. Now they're to be written on the tablet of our heart. And we need to trust him, lean on him with all our heart. Don't lean on what we think or what we feel. We need to keep going, leaning everything on him, acknowledging him in all our ways, and he will direct your paths in those difficult ways that are before you. You're not sure which way to go. Keep leaning on the Lord. Keep writing these attributes on your heart. Keep trusting him, and he will direct your path. He will make it straight as you put on his attributes to your heart attitudes. We're called to loving kindness. We're called to be tender-hearted, forgiving one another just as God in Christ has forgiven us. The Proverbs call us to be slow to anger repeatedly. And, and here's some verses that might be helpful to even write some of these down. 
But let's, let's say them out loud together. You don't need to get, do the number, just the verses, the italics there. Let's read it. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. This is God's wisdom. This is God's way. We need to be slow to anger. Don't we need God's help for that? I know I do. There's God's wisdom there to help us and to show him to the world. And he is with us to help here. Don't miss this phrase that Exodus 34 verse 5 says, God came down. God came down. He descended. He stood with him. And he proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord stands with his servant. And he is proclaiming his name, and his name is what his servants are to, to do. It's actually the purpose of the book of Exodus, chapter 9, verse 16. The mission statement is that his name would be proclaimed to all the earth. So he's proclaiming to Moses what through Israel and through all of God's people needs to go out to all the earth. Jesus calls us to proclaim his name and to all nations, and he says, as you do that, I will be with you always to the end of the age. That's the promise as we proclaim forgiveness in his name, like Exodus 34 talks about. This is what makes missions possible and powerful. In fact, when Nineveh repented in Old Testament times, Jonah said this, I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Jonah knew it I mean, this, is, this was just part of, they, they knew this, they understood this. Jonah wasn't real excited about it, was he? he? He wasn't living that out, was he? He wasn't that towards pagans, merciful, gracious, abounding in steadfast love. But you know what? God was still to Jonah, merciful, gracious, abounding in steadfast love, slow to anger, a better prophet than Jonah. Joel applies Exodus 34, 6, this way, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Again, they keep repeating this verse. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so what Joel's doing now is he's putting it into, if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Who is that name of the Lord in the New Testament, in Acts 2, in Romans 10? That verse is quoted as talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have to see that connection as we look at this amazing grace and mercy, this abundant, steadfast love and abundant salvation. As the gospel went out to all the nations in Acts 2, Peter quoted that for calling on the name of the Lord Jesus and Peter would write in his letter that the Lord is gracious. He would say to those who were not Jewish people, you have obtained mercy. You have become a people. He, he says in 2 Peter 3, Jesus is long-suffering still. He is patient so that you won't perish. That's why he hasn't come in judgment yet, that you would come to repentance, that you would call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Romans 10 says, you must confess Jesus is Lord to be saved. And then he quotes that verse for missions. And this all points to Jesus in Exodus 34, verse 10, where God says, behold, I am making a covenant before all your people. I will do marvels such as not have been created in any all the earth or in any nation and all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. There's something even more awesome than all of the miracles, the miracles of the, the flood, the miracles of, of uh, bringing them through the Red Sea and the plagues and all that. There's something greater. There's a greater exodus to come. There's greater miracles to come in the future through the Jews and ultimately through Jesus. All the world would see the work of God beyond that generation and even beyond that nation. Israel's Messiah would make all marvel, and he still does to this day, through the marvels that he did. And people among Israel saw Christ's awesome wonders, his miraculous creation and salvation. 
And he's the one who answers that question that I mentioned earlier of verse 7, how God can forgive and yet not clear the guilty. Or the New American Standard says it this way, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. But God does have a means where that guilt can be really punished on another. This is where the gospel comes in and answers that justice, forgiveness question, and it resolves the tension. But even in the, in the law, the next time that word guilty, the guilty who are, cannot be unpunished, next time it appears is Leviticus 6, verse 6 and 7, where he talks about an unblemished guilt offering that, quote, can make atonement for him before the Lord, and he shall be forgiven for any of the things which one may do and thereby become guilty. Because punishment was enacted and executed upon this one. And the ultimate forgiving atonement for the guilty, even in the law, required a sinless substitute as a guilt offering. And Isaiah 53 said Jesus would, quote, render himself as a guilt offering. The righteous one, through what he did, Isaiah 53 says, will justify the many. Justifying doesn't mean to declare me not guilty. It is actually declaring me righteous by another in my place. In my place condemned, he stood. So that guilt was not left unpunished. It was punished on him on the cross. God can by no means leave guilty sin unpunished. Sin will be punished either on you eternally or on Christ at Calvary. Do you see that? He, he does not let it slide. He does not just cover it up or pretend it didn't happen and just wash it away, wipe it away. It's going to be punished either on you eternally or on Christ at Calvary for those who repent and trust him and him alone. You say, well, maybe you think, I'm, I'm not guilty. Well, James 2.10 says, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all. And Romans 3 says, all mouths are, will be shut up on judgment day because the whole world is guilty before God. But Romans 3 says, God can be just and the justifier through the life and death and resurrection of Christ. The guilty are not cleared They are credited a real righteousness by one who was really punished to really pay their debt. That's the glory of the gospel. My sin upon his shoulders until it was accomplished. It was my sin that held him there. His wounds have paid my ransom. Do do you see that? Do you believe that? Are you banking on that? And and are you willing to commit your life to this one as Lord, the one who is the Lord merciful and gracious to all who turn from their sin to trust him? This Lord who looked on the multitudes of thousands and he was moved with compassion as he saw them. His love was abounding to 10,000 times 10,000. And praise the Lord, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Amen. Let's pray to him. Our great and gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in love, faithfulness, truth, forgiving, and yet not clearing the guilty. Lord, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for Christ. But I pray in light of all these truths, Lord, that we would confess our sins, knowing that you're just and faithful to forgive, and that we would live in light of these truths, that we would share this message with others, that we would reflect more of who you are. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.